All right, so I'm just trying to work on a side project right now. Um, as you might have seen in some other videos, I'm trying to work on a project where users can go on and kind of generate thumbnails for YouTube. I mean, this can mainly just help me make better thumbnails and I can use this app, but I plan to like convert this to a SaaS where people can pay a monthly subscription to be able to create premium thumbnails if they want to. So I need to figure out what I'm actually going to add to this project at this point. But um, I think one thing, let me just kind of refresh my memory as to what this app even does. The one thing I didn't even try this app is like use it on a smaller monitor. And obviously it doesn't seem like it really looks that good on a smaller monitor. So I need to kind of figure out what things we should hide. Um, let me zoom out some. So one thing I've kind of realized is that maybe we don't need all the templates displayed here, or maybe there's a way you can kind of collapse this. So I know in some applications they have like buttons for collapsing and expanding different um, columns. So maybe we can work on that. Um, ability to bookmark thumbnails. Hey, Tina, what you doing? Professor, okay. That's your new uh, pet name for me. All right, so here I'm going to try to add a button. So first thing I need to do is find the actual like component that renders this. One thing I like to do in React is if you have this components extension installed, which I guess I don't have it installed. Oh, it just took a while to show up. If you go to the components tool and click on the second select element and hover over your component, it tells you what component this is. So template panel. So it really helps if you just do that and you can go to your code base and say template panel, and that'll take you right to the thing that you're looking for. Um, so on this panel, what we're trying to do is we want to add an icon to the top right that allows us to collapse this panel. So let's try to do that. And again, I'm trying to also learn Tailwind. So I might be going to the Tailwind docs and just looking some stuff up. But <clears throat> this should probably exist on the same line, or this, the same row as templates. So we could probably use some type of flex here. So I'll just try to do a flex. I don't know why that didn't autocomplete. There we go. The so flex, I'll add an H1. And I think you can say like space between. Let me see if my autocomplete will tell me. I'll have to go to the docs. But anyway, this is an icon here. So I'll say like, if collapse and I don't even remember how we have icons in this project I think we have a lock icon here so if I were to look at how we're doing it for this template card I believe there is an icon called lock and lock comes from a third-party library we're called using called phosphor react so I need to go and look at phosphor react and see what icons are available to us. Hmm. Sorry, I'm trying to load up my stream on my phone as well so I can see like comments. And I went to YouTube Kids. Yeah, 
Yeah, so someone said justify between. So thank you so much for that comment. Uh, let's go and add that real quick. <clears throat> and I added it to the wrong thing. Yeah, so I need to go through Tailwind and like memorize all of the a lot of the flexbox and CSS grid helpers and stuff because I think that it really helped me become more efficient. Um, zoom in a little bit and I'll try to answer some of these questions. So, so Shaku's Crypto says, what made you want to learn Tailwind? Honestly, it's because a lot of other people use Tailwind. Um, so I wanted to give it a shot. I mean, there's other like UI libraries like Chakra UI and stuff that seem like it's interesting to kind of learn that too. But whenever there's a piece of technology that has a lot of momentum, like it doesn't hurt to try to learn it. I know it's kind of like bandwagoning, wagoning, but I wanted to actually give it like a solid try to see if like, is this thing actually make me more productive? And I could see how it could make you pr more productive because you don't have to like jump between styles that you might have like defined up here the the cohesion or sorry the um yeah the cohesion between your styles and your components are like right there so it's it can make you more performant or proficient i'm using the wrong words but i'm just i have to memorize these because right now i'm just not reaching that proficiency because i just don't i don't have a lot of these things memorized yeah, sometimes i'll be <clears throat> i'll be trying to like style some text and i'll do like text hyphen color and i know i have like autocomplete like I can do something like this and it gives me like all the options of what I can do, but yeah, hope that makes sense. Okay. So, um, justify between is the class, you know, let me just load up the tailwind CSS docs right now, just so I have it. And by the way, I have my webcam like at the top right. So if I forget about it or if it's blocking anything, let me know. But I think this is a good position for the webcam because there's nothing really ever going on at the top right of my screen. There's no terminal. There's no, like, no one cares about the VS Code buttons up here. All right. So justify between. All right. So that should take an element and push them apart, which is how... I could use this to maybe, yeah, there it is, collapse. It's in white, so I have to like go and change that. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to get an icon. And I don't know where the list of icons are. I guess I'll have to go to the docs here. Um, all right, so I'm trying to find if there's like a collapse icon, collapse. I don't know what people use for collapse icons, to be honest, I could use something like this. So I'd have to find like, Music J, Music G says on their website, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but uh, let's grab this one, arrow left, and I'm going to go ahead and Paste that here. I don't think I need to put that in a div. Arrow left. Let's see if this auto imports. JSX expression must have one parent. Uh, I think I deleted that on accident. All right, the icon is not showing up, so I need to figure out why that's happening. Let's go to the console, see if there's errors. 
Some, one thing I noticed with Next.js is sometimes you like have to do hard refreshes of your page to actually see your changes. I haven't fully read the docs to understand like when Next does the hot module reloading versus when it doesn't and like when you actually have to manually refresh or when it just refreshes your page for you. I think for the most part it does a good job, but I'm not sure why I'm not getting my icon here. It is showing up, so maybe I just need to change the color. Do something else. Yeah, that's the issue. All right, so let's go back to that icon. And I think I could probably just add some class name to it and say like text gray 600. All right, so that's not working. So, I mean, it, it might be easier just to add text gray to the entire div here. Yeah, let me read the docs. Um, Music G says there's a fill. Yeah, there's a color right here. So that's <laughs> that's one issue that I have. But well, I don't know if I can use color. Maybe any CSS color. Yeah, so the issue is I, I want to use the Tailwind built-in classes, right? So I could potentially put like a hex string here, but I want to use the pre-built Tailwind class, you know, text gray 600. And I want to put it on this arrow. Um, so I need to figure out if there's a way to actually do that. I'm sure there is. Color lime green. That's the problem I have with using some type of component libraries is that like something that should be accessible or added onto every component sometimes doesn't exist. Like why doesn't, why don't these things have class name? All right, I should be able to style these things with classes if I want to, but their component library doesn't support that. So I had to figure out either to just use, um, oh, obviously I have this hard coded to red. So that's probably the issue. All right, so it's showing up now. Um, I don't know. I thought I hard refreshed the page and that style stuck around. Let me try refreshing one more time. Like I thought when you did a hard refresh, the style should be wiped out from your Chrome browser. The Coos says, are you using Vercel? I do. Yeah, I do plan to deploy this to Vercel. Um, just to give it a shot, I'm not sure how much the pricing is going to potentially affect, like if this actually becomes a real SaaS product. Um, I hear Vercel can get really expensive depending on how much traffic you get, but I think for something small like this where you didn't, where I probably won't have that many people up front, I could use just like the $20 a month to um, have it hosted, but I could just host this next app on like a a digital ocean box and that would be five dollars a month and if the goal is to kind of increase the profit or as much profit as i can from this web app and i don't care too much about performance or speed then that's the approach i might take there's also plugins you can use to kind of deploy your next application to amazon like i think there's like a serverless next js module uh, i think it's this one I haven't used this one before. Um, it says zero configuration next 10 and 11. I'm using 12 right now, so I'm kind of concerned that maybe it won't, it won't work. But you can basically deploy your entire next application to Amazon. And typically Amazon's gonna be a lot cheaper. It's usually a lot more complex to figure it all out. But if you already know Amazon Web Services and you're kind of familiar with uh, CloudFront, how Lambdas work, how CloudFront Edge works, you could probably save a lot of money just by deploying this thing to Amazon instead of using for a sale. Hmm. 
Yeah, I could wrap this in an icon um, or a div or whatever. I just decided to put text gray here. Um, and then I could probably just remove text gray here. So that's not like a duplicate thing. But yeah, anyway, so let's focus on, uh, <laughs> I got off topic, but let's focus on clicking on this icon and having this panel like collapse. So let's see how we can do that. So we could add some state. So let's try to first find some state. Um, I'll say const is expanded. Set is expanded equals use state. And I'm going to say expanded by default will be true. Um, <clears throat> not find. Yeah, I don't know why that took like five minutes to auto import. Okay, five seconds, not five minutes. But okay, so what I want to do is if we are expanded, we want to show one view. And if we're not, we want to show a different view. Thank you, Tina, for the reminder. Yeah, everyone give the stream a thumbs up if you're watching and this is helping you out. You know, I think I'm smelling dog poop. I was, was going to pause this stream and go check, but I'll just leave it there until I'm done. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, if we're expanded, we'll do one thing. And if we're not expanded, we're going to do another thing. Um, I didn't, so I'm using a, a template generator for this project, right? I use the T3 stack by, I don't know if you know the YouTuber Theo, he has like an open source stack that you can use that basically spins up next with TypeScript, ERPC, um, <clears throat> next auth and Prisma. <laughs> yeah, no wonder, it's like I'm sitting here recording, I keep smelling dog poop, I'm like, dude, this is a strong smell. But yeah, uh, let me actually show that real quick. D3 stack, yo, GitHub. Um, if you haven't seen this YouTuber, like his channel is going to blow up. He's going to get like 200,000 subscribers in less than like a couple of months. But I guess he, he used to work at Twitch and he is now working on his own side project for streaming stuff. But he has this, um, this generator that his community is working on, which I've used to kind of spin up this project. This is the stack. It just has Next, LN, TypeScript, Prisma, Next Auth, and TRPC. The only thing that's kind of out of the ordinary is TRPC. So it doesn't use REST, it doesn't use GraphQL, it uses something called TRPC. But I, yeah, I didn't configure anything. It's just these at symbols work out of the box. So I don't know if there's a TS config file for allowing that. I don't even know what that's called. Is this like aliasing or something? Yes, Next. Um, I'd have to go see like how, like what configuration, is that a TypeScript thing that allows you to import at the project root or is that like a next thing? Anyway, let me stay focused. So if we're expanded, we can just do something like this. And if we're not expanded, we're going to do, I'll just say hello. A string of hello. In fact, I'll do like a div that says hello. Someone said, Abby, Abby says it's in path. So I'll go check that out in a second. Let me not get too distracted. Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming this thing has to be wrapped in a fragment. Like so. All right, so let's just verify this works. I did a semicolon. I think it's still refreshing. And to verify this works, what I could do is just go to my state variable. And I'm just going to force it to be false by default. And that should refresh my page. And that template should kind of go away. 
There we go. So it says hello. So when it's collapsed, we want to instead show... What do we want to show? Adding four with a Y. So I'm going to keep some of the same stuff, but the main difference is we don't want width of 96. We probably want to set this width to an actual value of like eight or something. Or we could just not set the width and see what happens. But if it has no width, we can put an icon in here. Probably call like arrow right or something. Arrow line right. Go ahead and auto import that. Yeah, Rohan, uh, <laughs> that's why I'm, I keep saying I need to buy a new laptop. Like, I even scaled down to 720p so that I can actually like record and have my webcam on. Like the moment you start recording, like this this computer just starts falling apart. But luckily on Monday they should be shipping my new laptop. Like half the time auto import just doesn't seem like it knows how to import this. Like you see here, I'm trying to import arrow right, line right and like it just couldn't find it. Here we go. Uh, class name cannot find. Like look at this, I'm hovering over class name. It says cannot find arrow left right. And then it took five seconds and now it's working. Anyway, let me not complain. I'm sure there's people out there with slower laptops than my MacBook. But icon is not showing up because probably the text gray 600 needs to be applied here. What's up, Ashok? Jason, welcome to the stream. All right, so now we got this little expand icon. And... When the user clicks it, this is the next step, is when the user clicks it, we need to you know, expand the thing out and put it back in. So how do I do that? Well, there's a button here that is expanded. And when they click on this icon, I could probably add an on-click listener to here. But if you wanna be accessible, Typically, everything that a user can click should either be a link or a button. So it might make more sense to make this a button that's unstyled and add an on-click onto it. And I could basically just say, like, that is expanded to true. Actually, this one will be false. And I'm going to go ahead and move this, nest it. And then I could do the same thing. Yeah, Rohan, I could put cursor pointer that make it act like it's a button. But again, like I'm, you got to remember that you want to make your applications accessible. And when you actually use like the DOM element button or the DOM element link or the A tag, I mean, it allows people who are like vision impaired to be able to hit tab and kind of go directly to that button if they want to. See, if I didn't wrap this in a button, the user couldn't easily just tap to it, I don't think. You'd have to like do some extra like hackery to get it working. But now, if I tap to it, click expand and collapse, there we go. And we get the cursor by default because it is a button. Cool. So it's kind of hard to see this. Like, first of all, when I hover over it, I would like the style to change some. I don't know if you guys noticed this. The whole reason I'm doing this again is because like on smaller monitors, this application is just not usable. Oh, that's it. <laughs> okay, well, let's focus on doing some styling. So I'd like some feedback when I hover over this. I'll make it like some other color, I don't know, gray. So how do I make it so when I hover over something, it changes text? I think I need to add a class name here. And then there's like a directive on Tailwind called hover text red 400. I think that's how you do it. Okay, there we go. Now, I don't know if red's the best color, um, honestly, like I haven't really thought about the design palette or like what stuff wants to be, but I guess that works for right now. I'm gonna add the same class to the button here. 
and make it consistent. So Rohan asks, why not do old state arrow, not old state for toggling the sidebar? <clears throat> um, I would do that if I did a different approach to the button. These are two different DOM elements, right? I have a DOM element for the right button and a DOM element for the left button. If they were all, if they were both the same DOM element, like if I didn't have this button kind of duplicated, I could toggle it. Um, I'm trying to think of how to explain this. Does that make sense? Like if this is just one DOM element, if I didn't have two separate ones, like I would have just done that is expanded, not is expanded like this. But the fact that I can't just do that here because I'd have to do it over here, it just seems kind of strange because it's not really a toggling button anymore. It's an actual button that does a specific piece of functionality. So I don't know if I explained that well, but that's kind of why. Um, I want to add a little bit of padding to the top of this. I'm going to say padding top of six, just to bring that button down just a tad. Um, I don't know if it's worth doing the same thing for options. I mean, options is like a critical piece of functionality that probably should always be displayed to a user. This is more of like a little help bar. Like if you wanted to quickly switch between your templates, I wanted to add the ability to basically hamburger is ideal icon for sidebars. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure about that one. Um, the reason I don't think that is... Because the X, to me, the X means close, right? We're not closing this, though. We're just collapsing it. So I could probably find a different application like Figma that has these sidebars. And we can kind of see how they do it. Or even Gmail probably has sidebars. You know, even maybe YouTube has sidebars. So you are right. They do have expand and collapse for the menu. Let me just see how Figma does it real quick. By the way, welcome to the stream, y'all. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, I'm just working on a little side project. And right now I'm just adding some features and functionality. But what we're trying to do is to see like if you actually have a small screen and you're dealing with like sidebar stuff, what is the typical design approach that applications use to allow users to collapse and expand? Um, I want to see if it's Uh, if you make an app, don't don't add pop-ups. I know they're trying to market their stuff and like get you to buy stuff, but just pop-ups are so annoying. I don't think you can even expand or collapse in here. Let me try to get even smaller. Oops. I can't even zoom into this app. It just zooms into the actual page. So, uh, I don't know. If anyone else... I'll come back and change those icons. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. No, I don't want to use Gmail because you might see my actual like emails, even though I don't have anything sensitive, but it's fine. If anyone just, uh, I'll change it to hamburger in a bit. I want to actually work on something else here. I wanted that maybe we could work on the ability for users to, to bookmark templates, right? So um, the idea, someone asked, Aitan asked, what's the app, what's the app is about? Um, the app is about basically allowing an easier way for YouTubers who aren't designers to come in here and change, uh, to make like template YouTube thumbnails, right? So like they could come in here and they could add an image. 
like this and they can if this was like a transparent image it would look better this looks awful right now but let's see if i can find that the lady in the red dress let's see i guess i gotta go to workspace i gotta find through all this stuff that i need to delete from my workspace public so the idea is like you could potentially have a a bunch of pre-made images you can like make a, a silly thumbnail like this i'm not sure what that red thing in the background is like kind of Maybe we need to delete that. But you can kind of design it with a, you know, a preset of things. And then later you click generate image and you get a actual PNG that you can upload to YouTube. So that is the idea. Uh, I think I also supported gradients. I forgot I did this, but you can do like gradients on your page if you want to. Okay, that obviously doesn't work anymore, so I have to figure out why that doesn't work. And I'm actually working on this app with Rohan over here, so he is helping me out. Um, try to implement some logic. But yeah, so what do I want to work on next? Um, I wanted to have the ability for users to either bookmark or keep track of a history of thumbnails that they've used. Because... As you notice, most YouTubers have like a certain style of thumbnails that they continue to publish every single time. But I think it would be useful to be able to bookmark our, our heart, our favorite thumbnails and have those kind of show up. Um, so yeah, let's just try that and see how far we get, how much progress we get. So on these, this template card, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a icon or a button for favoriting the, the thing. So let's go to template card. I believe I use the same card for both. And what we wanna do is somewhere here, we have buttons that are displayed. Okay, so we have a use button here. Why is this being flexes applies the same way. Um, does this need to be block or flex? Let me just fix this lint error real quick. Probably want to keep it block. Yeah, Rohan, I'm not like too worried about the actual like template designs. I feel like at some point we're going to have to like either hire a designer to come through and just generate like hundreds of these, or we're going to have to go through YouTube and find some of the nicest looking icons and try to replicate them. Um, so at some point we'll come back and make the icons actually like look nice, but I think adding the actual functionality is much more important so we can actually prototype and see like, how's this app working? Okay. So we do want to use flex, not block. May I know how you got that canvas for editing? Oh, my eyes suck. Uh, so Vam, she asks how I got the canvas. When you say canvas, what do you mean? Do you mean like, if I go back to the actual template, you think you're talking about this preview thing? Um, if you are, this isn't a canvas. This is just a DOM element that has like things positioned in it. And there is a plugin that you can use to basically take a DOM element and it'll convert the DOM element to an image. I think behind the scenes, it might use canvas and it renders all the DOM elements to the canvas and then exports it to a PNG. So hopefully, I think that's what you're asking. I'm, I'm sure you're not asking about Figma anywhere, but yeah, this is just a DOM element. Um, okay, so going back to templates, we need to add one for starring. So first of all, let's add a button here. And I'm gonna go ahead and just add, uh, a, you know, odd bookmarks. How about that? Bookmark is typically a name for stuff. You can use hearts, you can use other things, but we don't care if it's premium. So a lot of this stuff I'm going to delete. But we do want, let's, let me just go ahead and clear some of this stuff out for now. We don't need to use class names because there is no dynamic class happening here. So let's delete that. All right, so we have a button inside that button. We got a lock and we got some text. And what we want to do is find a different icon. So instead of a lock, let's go to phosphor icons and let's find what we can use for bookmark. 
bookmark, simple bookmark. I don't know which one we want to use. Probably the one that says bookmark. Go ahead and paste that in. Save this. Oh, you know, what? I guess class themes do work. Because we had margin right set to that bookmark before. So let me just try to see what happens if I save this and auto import that bookmark icon. Still red, still red. What's going on here? Did he even auto import? He did. There we go. Finally went away. Um, yeah, so go back to the app. Now we got a button that says bookmark. Now in terms of styling, like, I don't know if maybe having a button like this is good. Um, maybe just having an icon, probably. Let's just do that. So I'm going to get rid of the text because the bookmark is kind of self-explanatory. Like everyone kind of knows what the bookmark icon is. And maybe, I don't know, now that I think about it, maybe we should do a heart instead, but I think a bookmark makes more sense. Um, we'll keep it a button, but we don't want to give it like a background color or anything. So we don't want green. We don't care if it's rounded. We don't want shadow. We don't want hover. I don't know why it has transition. I guess that was for the hover. Duration, we don't care about. Let me get rid of all this stuff. So it's text large, flex, font semi bold, padding on the Y's, two padding on the X is six. I think keeping the padding might be useful because. I don't know if you used apps where like the icons are really small and it's very hard to like move your mouse over. Like even this, like you gotta be very accurate with your, your mouse to be able to click on stuff. But let's see, I'm gonna add some text. We probably need to make it like yellow or something. I don't know. Text yellow, we'll do 300 and then hover will be text yellow 400. Let's give that a shot and see what happens. I'm gonna move my phone closer so I can read your comments. I can't believe how bad my eyes are getting. Um, all right, here's a bookmark. Here's a button. Um, I think it'd be cool to do the justify between again to like face these. So instead of justify in, I'm gonna say justify between. And that should just push them apart. Hopefully. There we go. We can figure out the actual like design. Why is this not? I got so much extra padding on this thing, like I gotta delete some stuff. Padding left got it needs to go. Padding Y probably needs to go. Um, padding X, let's just delete that as well. Let's just try all this. Padding right, we don't care about. Margin bottom, margin top, I guess we can keep that. All right, let me, let me answer some comments. I see some comments come in. So, um, HTML to image, icon at the top, top right. I'd have to go back and figure out what you're talking about there. The icons. Oh, you're saying the bookmark at the top right. Yeah, that's typically how they do it, don't they? Um, we'll go. We'll change that in just two seconds. So Bed Laman says GraphQL is such a pain to use when your schema isn't actually evolving at the start of a project. So much stuff to update that all has to line up perfectly. I don't know if that was like a separate thing or is that related to GraphQL? I haven't really used GraphQL, um, so I don't really know. I can't really talk about it. It seems like it would be useful for some situations, but for the most part, I'm fine with using REST. I've been looking into a new new approach called TRPC. After I've been using REST for so long, I'm starting to like stop caring about endpoints. 
such a pain to like think about how to create your endpoints and then like what methods you need to use where um i've been using trpc which is like you just define a function name and you call it and that's it so it kind of takes out that burden of having to like craft your your urls and stuff but yeah i mean i think graphql is pretty cool for like <clears throat> your ui your your <coughs> sorry I need some water but your ui to like be able to pick and choose what data gets back from the back end but honestly that sounds like a premature optimization like just it's cool if you send back some extra data like you're not building facebook I guarantee you you're not building facebook so if the benefits for graphql don't really apply to your side project then like don't use it i think setting up the resolvers is actually kind of complicated um but again like i haven't really used it so i'm gonna stop talking about it what's up benson welcome so benson's another person who's kind of like working on a little side project for me so Welcome to the stream. Nick Unja Sani, can we see the UI UX of your project? Um, not sure what that means. I think I was sharing it just a second ago, but I'll, I'll go through it real quick. I'm doing good. Thanks for asking, Vincent. Noah, are these Chakra UI cards? Um, Noah, no, I'm using Tailwind CSS, and I just went to find some free Tailwind CSS components. There's like a, a, a library, or sorry, a website you can go to where you basically just copy code directly into your project, and they've basically figured out all the Tailwind classes, and you get the exact same styling that you want. And then you kind of have to add whatever functionality you might need. Anarch says, do you do you what happened to the other youtuber named joe uh i don't know who's joe i don't think i know a joe <clears throat> benson's here benson all right so figure out the t3 stack huh yeah, no, I've been kind of just using that. Honestly, like, <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Theo's uh, videos. He just knows so much, it's crazy. Like, I, I wish I was on that level of just, like, uh, domain knowledge for front-end and stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of like an inspiration watching him. And, like, his, his channel is going to bro blow up. I think he was at, like, 5,000 subscribers, like, two months ago or something. Now he's at 20,000. So he's going to be, like, hitting... 100,000 in a couple of months, probably. What's up, Dante? Welcome to the stream. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, they're pretty similar. I mean, like, a, it's it's kind of hard to, like, make a card look different. Like, they're all kind of the same, like, rounded images. You got some shadow. You hover over stuff. It gets larger by a little bit. <laughs> really? Joe Mama? You joined the stream just to make a yo mama joke. I love it. Thank you for that joke. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the stack is like, I think the only groundbreaking thing or the thing that's like new is um, ERPC. Other than that, I mean, like the stack is pretty standard. Next.js is pretty standard for a lot of, you know, startups and people. Yeah, when it's pretty, or TypeScript is pretty standard for a lot of people. Yeah, one is pretty standard for a lot of people. Um, I think ERPC is like kind of the new thing that not many people know about. Hmm. Yeah, I thought Prisma is supposed to work. So Noah said, took me a long to figure out how to switch my Mongo schema to Prisma. Uh... I thought Prisma has built-in support for Mongo, so I don't think you'd actually need to change anything, but maybe you're talking about like the types that you have to add to your schema. Dante asked what stack. We're using something called the T3 stack, but it basically is just TypeScript, Next.js, Next.auth, one CSS, and TRPC for the communication layer between your UI and the backend. Um, check it out. I, th I mean, 
it's a pretty good stack. Like Prisma, oh yeah, Prisma for the database, like ORM. Uh, I could put a leave a comment here if you're interested in checking it out. But that's kind of what I've been just learning and using to see like, is it cool? Is it better than REST using TRPC? So far, it seems like it is better than using REST. It's a lot easier. All right, let me focus on what I'm doing. I haven't really made progress on this little bookmark icon. So we're going to add it to the top right because that's kind of how you're supposed to do it, I think. Oh, geez, I have 40 people watching the stream. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> I just now looked over. I had like 10 a second ago, and I got 40. Um, I think people add bookmarks to the top right of their UI elements. No, some people add it to the bottom. So here's like a card that has a heart icon at the bottom. Um, again, we're not, I'm not worried about the design. Let me not get held up. I'm just worrying on the functionality. So if I click on this button here, this bookmark icon, I want to actually add this thing to like a bookmarks collection. So let's try to figure out how to do that. I probably need to update my backend to support bookmarking stuff. So I need to kind of refresh my memory with MySQL and SQL and how to like set up relationships between that. So I'm going to go to my schema real quick. I got my Prisma schema. And I need to add a new table where a user has a one-to-many relationship between bookmarks and templates. I probably need to add templates here, to be honest. Like there's no... I don't have a model for my templates, so at some point I need to add that in, but let's see if we can do this. So let's go ahead and add a new model. Again, I'm a noob with Prisma, I'm a noob with Tailwind, I'm a noob with TRPC, I'm a noob with everything. This is just a big learning experience for me. All right, let's see what we can do. So a user can bookmark. Let's add a bookmark model. And somehow we got to tie that into a user. Uh, I'll put identifier as a string. ID is a string, default CUID. <clears throat> Man, I haven't used SQL in so long. So what do I want to do? I want to hook this up to a user first of all. So somehow there's like relationships here where session belongs to a user so i could probably do something like this and just put it here so now the bookmark belongs to a user it looks like you probably need to add a user id here so i'm gonna do that so now the bookmark has a relationship with the user model and we have a user id stored here each model must have at least one unique criteria that is only required Okay, uh, I guess we can just give it a unique ID here. Uh, template ID. So we don't have a template model yet. I might add that later on. Um, I want to make sure I can get this correctly. So we got a bookmark model. has a unique ID on it. It belongs to a user. And it also points to a template ID. So if we've done this correctly, we should be able to run a migration. So let's go back to, I'll make a new tab here. And to basically apply this change to my locally running MySQL database, I can say MPX Prisma migrate dev. I think that'll like say that like, hey, it's noticing some changes. Prisma sees that I made some changes and it's gonna ask me for a migration script name. I'll say adding bookmark. And that'll make a file called, uh, well, you can see it right here. It made a migration script, basically. And then it applies the migration script to your MySQL database. So if I were to go to MySQL now, which I have running locally, I'm going to show you that I have some databases. So let's use that database. And I'm going to say select star from user, go tables. All right, so now we got the bookmark table here. That's the cool thing about Prisma is it like does all the 
the nitty gritty SQL stuff behind the scenes and creates a table for you with whatever fields that you want. And it's also so, supposed to be pretty abstracted away. So like you can kind of set Prisma to work with MySQL, Postgres, Mongo. I believe there's one called like CockroachDB or something. But yeah, we got a table created. Uh, let me go back to the comments, see what I'm missing. Noah says it is it has some support, but I also switch from document style to more relational DB style. So as to stay forward compliant with any DB switches in the future. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, does anyone here actually work full time with Mongo or NoSQL databases? I'm curious what you guys think about it. Um, I worked with SQL for the longest time, and then I switched over to DynamoDB at Amazon. Um, I've been working on, on, on Dynamo for like two to three, you know, three to four years, and sometimes just trying to wrap your head around how NoSQL works is just kind of painful. I'll probably have a video published about that soon, but. Sheldon says, if we missed, can we start from, yeah, I'm gonna, I think all my streams automatically get uploaded to GitHub, so yeah, it'll be uploaded. Son of Four says D. Son of Four says, do you use DTOS, data transfer objects with database entities, or you use those types directly? Um, I'll show you in just a second, Stun, if you stick around. You basically, Prisma gives you like data models that you can call functions on. Um, Abdulrahman says, I think you should have a primary key for all those for all three fields in bookmark. Noah says my job is full-time Mongo mostly, but still lots of SQL around. NoSQL style is really nice in a lot of ways. Yeah, here NoSQL is really good for like when you need to deal with scale. Um, but I guess there's a fine line between like when if when is your project reach a scale that like SQL no longer SQL no I can't speak. Like whenever you reach that point where SQL is no longer gonna work for your your database and your data because of all the inner joins that you're doing and stuff, but. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I am, I'm using, I'm using Prisma, which is the ORM, which is communicating with MySQL. Um, all right, let me get back. I'm getting distracted by all your questions, but thank you for asking the questions. I appreciate the questions and I'll try to answer some more in a second. So someone said I should add primary keys to all these. I don't know if that, I don't know if I need to, I'll be honest, but all right, anyway, let's just try. So going back to the template card, I'm going to go ahead and try to add some functionality. So when I click on this icon, by the way, I don't like how like the cards expand it. This is bad UX in my opinion, because a user is moving their mouse to a button and then it expands and they might misclick that button. So I might actually get rid of that hover effect. I've just, I'm just getting annoyed by it. So let's go find that. Um, how do I do that? Hover, shadow, hover, scale. I'm going to get rid of that hover scale because that just, it throws me off. Yeah, Paras, I'm using a T3 stack. I'm just trying it out. Um, so when I click on this button, we need to invoke a TRPC method and kind of link this template ID to my user session or my user ID. So let's see if we can do that. Probably gonna run into a lot of bugs doing this on the live stream, but this is where all the fun is. Template card, template card. Uh, okay, so. Am hmm. I bearing my 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 bearing of where we do this if we even do it anywhere but there's a mutate async method you can use or it's called mutation async i believe let's i 
Nope, that's not it. ERPC dot. I know I do this someplace. Use mutation. Okay. So. Yeah, Dante, I just copied the card from an existing like Tailwind uh, component website and they had it do that cool little marketing hover thing. Um, so that's why I was kind of confused why it's doing that. But yeah, I can see what you mean. It's better to do it on small individual items, not the entire card itself. So with TRPC, you import this TRPC method and you can basically call a method here, right? We don't have a method defined yet. We're gonna have to set that up, but I'm gonna go ahead and say, we. I'm gonna pretend we have a method called bookmark template. Okay. And what that is gonna do is call a endpoint on the back end. Let me make a method here called bookmark template. And I don't remember how to pass data to it. I think I could just go down here. There's a the button here for the bookmark. I'm gonna say on click. I'm gonna call this method. And it might make more sense to work in the back end first. I'm kind of doing it from like uh the outside in versus the inside out. And usually it's always better to work on your back end and work your way back to the UI. At least that's how it works in my head. But we could basically grab, I think we have access to something called template ID. So when the user clicks on the button, we are going to basically uh, call that method. All right. And then we'll probably do something with this loading. I'm going to delete it for right now. <clears throat> but bookmark template. Uh, is a method that we haven't created yet. So let's try to figure out how to do the do that. Um, so with my project set up, I'm using again the T3 stack. So there is a source folder and inside of this there's a backend folder and it has a router. <coughs> Sorry y'all keep clearing my throat um and inside this router yeah i'm going to store the bookmarks someone asked the question they asked um Paris solanki Sol solanki said are you going to be storing the bookmarks in the database i am um i don't know if you saw it but i just added a new schema change to support the bookmark that links a user to a template I ran the migration script locally. That should be all set up now. And yeah, that's what we're working on. So if I click on the bookmark icon, we need to basically call a method that we haven't created. So right now, like I'm just gonna hack this on to my main router, but with TRPC, you can actually like kind of have nested routes set up. So like you see here, we have a merge command, which is merging another router into the checkout router, but uh, what I'm going to do for now, um, I try to do the simplest thing first, and then I will refactor later on. I'm going to take this existing mutation because I think that's the only mutation we have in this project, which is when you're trying to sign up with Stripe. And I'm going to go ahead and paste that here. Um, a lot of the stuff might have to go away. Let's delete this. Let's see if I can remember how to use Zod. I think for Zod, you can define like a template ID and I could say Z dot string maybe. I don't know. I have to go to the Zod docs. I don't remember how to do this, to be honest. It's always frustrating when you learn a new tech or new new stack. It's like you don't remember how to do a lot of the stuff. And you have to like go and read the docs and like memorize how to do it. How does this, does this have an input? <clears throat> yeah, we'll figure it out. All right, so what this endpoint needs to do is I need to rename it. If you remember in the front end, we called it bookmark template. So if I go over here and just change the mutation name to bookmark template, uh, and if I were to save this, uh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around. Let me comment some stuff out so I can save it because right now it's going to crash. 
because I got some syntax error stuff. Let me just comment it all out. How about that? All right, so save the file. I go back and notice that my TypeScript error went away because the way the mutation works and how TRPC works with this whole setup is that like you can get a list of your existing backend endpoints, right? This is the main benefit you can argue to using TRPC. You have this like type safety between your front end and back end. The contract is just kind of baked in. So bookmark template, if I click on this, like it just autofills and I can call that back end method. Um, and then if I go down here, you see that I'm getting an error. It's saying I need to pass template ID, right? So this is why people argue you should use TypeScript because it tells you exactly what you're doing wrong. And I'm starting to uh, drink the Kool-Aid. I think it makes sense. So now I should be able to pass template ID. Uh, why is this? I don't know if this is my editor's just taking a while. Yeah, there we go. So it's working now. Keep this. All right, so let's let's verify this thing works. I'm gonna go ahead and put a console log, and I want to make sure that is input the actual thing that we want here. Just go ahead and do input and save that. And we're gonna click on that button here in a second and see if we broke everything or if this actually works. So go here, I'm gonna go to my network tab, make sure I can see that network request being sent back. I'm gonna wait for my browser to refresh because I think Next is still trying to load, doing something. All right, click on bookmark. We get a request to our backend. Uh, you see here it sent a request to bookmark template. And the payload that gets sent over is kind of like ugly, I'll be honest. But if you look here, we actually sent the template ID over. And hopefully, if we go to our backend, that prints out. Okay, so now we have access to the arguments that we're trying to send to our backend, which is pretty cool. Um, so I need to basically figure out which user is sending over the request. Um, there's a way, I'm using next auth. So like I have this session that's accessible inside of a cookie. Right now I'm doing some stuff that probably is hacky. Um, like I'm taking the token and I'm getting, I'm getting the token from the cookie. If you know a better way, if you guys are familiar with next auth, I know there's a way to like set up the, the session with a callback here. You know, it says the session should have an ID on it. Let me try that real quick. I should have the ID of the user on the session. I, I forgot I set this stuff up, but let's see if this works. Um, so if I were to print out what context that session is, I think I should have the user ID who made the request. So let's go here. Go ahead and click on the bookmark icon. Go back to my back end. Here we go. We got the user ID. I should probably rename this to user ID. Might make more sense, but whatever. Um, so yeah, we need to basically verify if there is no session, which I should say not, then what we want to do is we want to throw an error. Okay, you must be logged in to bookmark a template. So far, this is making sense, y'all. So if we're not logged in, there should be no session, which means that we should throw an error. Um, and then secondly, we know what the user ID is. So I'm gonna say const user ID is equal to context session of ID. That's the user ID. Really wish I named it something else, but again, we can always just refactor later. And we're gonna tie it all in, right? We have the database table, which at this point, we should be able to persist this kind of relationship. So I'm gonna say uh, Prisma bookmark. 
because by default prisma depending on your model will create like a lowercase object this is this ties it all into someone asked a question like how does this all work um this is how it all works you have prisma and now that i added that schema i have an object that i can call and i can do some methods here now how do i actually create something i don't remember so let's see if there's some auto um complete there's a create thing here and let's see what it's telling us we need to pass in. I mean, honestly, we could say user ID is equal to user ID, template ID. And I think ID is auto-generated, so we don't need to like worry about that. Let's try this. Is this going to work? We're not using input, so this needs to be input.template ID. Um, I think the way it works with Prisma is you actually need to pass it like a data. Yeah, Stun of 4, I'm not using JWT. I'm, not, um, I'm using an actual like session, storing the sessions in the database. So I don't think that will work. Why is this not working? Unknown is not assignable to the type string. Isn't this supposed to be... I I have to come back through. This is like a hack. Um All right. So I think we should just cast this to string. Bookmark is assigned a value but never used. Why is this not indenting when I save? All right, I think we're at the home stretch. So this will create the bookmark, and then I think we just want to return the bookmark. So let's try that. Uh, by the way, all I'm probably gonna start live streaming a lot more when my new laptop comes in. I don't know if you guys noticed, but like <laughs> when I try to save a file, it takes like 20 seconds for my editor to actually save it sometimes because I'm using a MacBook from 2015. It has like two cores, and it ha I think it has like one core, two threads, or something. I don't know. It has like eight gigabytes of memory. My hard drive is always filled up. But let's see if this works. So I'm gonna go ahead and. Click on this button. Actually, let me, before I do that, let me show you something. I'm going to go to my terminal here, log back in to my SQL, use template generator. What is this called? Welcome everyone to the stream. If you just joined, I'm just working on a little side project that I hope can make into an actual SaaS product at some point. But let's just go ahead and look at bookmarks real quick. So select star from bookmark. And there's nothing, right? And that's expected because I haven't clicked on any buttons yet. But let's go over here and I'm going to go ahead and click on the bookmark button. And my back end crashed. Beautiful. So let's go and figure out what's wrong with my back end. If that's even the issue. Um, let me read the error. Cannot read properties of undefined reading create. So my backend definitely crashed. Cannot read properties of undefined reading create. I'll probably go to my comments. It seems like people who uh, watch the stream always have the answers. Let's see. Let me catch up real quick. <clears throat> Let's see. So, yep, I got that working with the Zod inputs. Noah says, one thing I found about the stack so far is that sometimes I just need to reload the editor because I get false flag errors that vanish when I reload, especially after Prisma generates. Yeah, I've noticed that a lot. Like, I just, refreshing everything is like the default. Like, refresh your next app, refresh your editor, stuff gets stuck. Um, let's see, Stunna says, I got a snipped of what I normally do when I'm using Next.js auth. Yeah, again, I'm not using JWT, so I can't really do that. SR says, did I try bun? No, not yet. Uh, I watched like a little video about it. It seems like it's pretty fast, but again, it's like experimental. It's like in beta, so I'm not really interested. 
I don't really get hyped about tech until it's out of beta. Because I don't want to use stuff that's buggy. I'll be honest with you all. I want to use stuff that's actually reliable. But if it is actually that fast, I think it's going to be a nice uh, improvement to writing JavaScript for your backend code. I think a lot of people will like talk crap about JavaScript because it's slow and Node's slow and stuff. Um, yeah, I think it's... We're, we're always slowly making improvements in this community. Uh, Paris says, in your create method, you have to pass data in your session. and You have to pass your session in data object, data your info. Yeah. Dante says, I hold VS Code terminal responsible to lag. Yeah, VS Code can get kind of slow as your project gets bigger, for sure. Aura says, use MPX Prisma Studio. It will show you all your data records in a nice dashboard. You know what? I just forgot about this. <laughs> I've never used this before, but let's just go ahead and add an alias to my uh, Prisma colon studio. And I'm going to go ahead and do this so I can load that up. Now, I don't know what loading another, yet another service while I do a live stream is going to do. It might just blow up everything. So I might hold off on actually running that, but I think if you run it, you get a nice UI you can hit on a certain port, and it kind of acts as your MySQL database. So instead of me going here and writing select statements, which makes me feel like I'm a, a pro programmer, um, I could probably just use a UI, which is probably a better approach. Um, but yeah, I think going back, going back to Noah's question, when the schema changes, sometimes you got to restart your application which is probably what I got to do here. So I'm going to restart my next app and I'm going to try to go back to my app. And refresh this real quick. So how's everyone doing today? What y'all working on? You guys, you guys have any cool side projects that you're working on? Any, any bugs that you spent three days trying to debug on your projects? I got I to gotta make this small talk when my app's reloading because it takes so freaking long. All right, let's try it again. So we are going to click on use. Man, I have so many errors in my terminal. I need to check that. But I'm going to click on the bookmark icon, and hopefully it didn't crash. I didn't get an error. So let's go back and let's check. I'm going to select from bookmark, and notice that now we have an entry in our database that linked the bookmark ID, user ID, and template. So cool, we just uh, completed the full circle. We have a full feature implemented for the user where this thing is now bookmarked. But the issue, I don't know what I've been streaming for. Tina, are you still watching the stream? Um, the issue now is that like, there's no like UX feedback between if I have this thing bookmarked or if I don't, right? So it'd be nice for the user to know what they've bookmarked. Usually they have it grayed out at first and then it's maybe like yellow. This is not, this, this, uh, <clears throat> this yellow on white is very bad. I need to fix this. This contrast is probably bad and I probably fail any type of accessibility checks. But yeah, I hope you guys are excited about that. We actually have a data um, and a record stored inside of our bookmark table now. Pretty cool. Hmm. All right, so for the next, the next steps, what do we need to do? Well, we need to, when this page loads, we need to fetch every bookmark that this user who's logged in has, okay? So what's, let's try to figure that out. And this time I'm gonna start with the back end. So I'm gonna work out the back end ERPC method so that we get that nice TypeScript autocomplete in the front end. Okay. So how do I do that? Um I don't know. Let's figure that out. Okay, at this point, um, like I said, like you can ch you can create different routers uh by just doing something like this. So I'm gonna say bookmark. Maybe I'll kind of make it match crud. So I'll have a bookmark endpoint, which is going to have all the logic for bookmarks. And I'm going to go ahead and copy an existing router that we have here. I'm going to paste it right here in bookmark. 
And I'm going to rename this to bookmark router. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, get book. Let's make a new query. We're going to have to fill this part out. But what we're going to do is I'm going to go back to that other router, not the checkout one. Let me go to this one down here, the main one. And instead of having this mutation defined at the top level, I'm going to go ahead and actually cut this out. And I'm going to put it inside this sub level uh, router, I guess you could say. And I'm, let me delete some of this stuff too. That makes sense. So we're basically making a, a sub router that TRPC can kind of, you know, split the stuff up in the smaller modules so it's more manageable. And we can merge, I believe, like this. I can say bookmark. And I'm going to go ahead and import bookmark router here. Get rid of that semicolon. You also hear chat went silent. You guys are just intrigued with how this stuff works, huh? All right, so bookmark. If my linting errors would go away at some point. Checkout router. This one complaining. All right, uh, I think that should be set up correctly. And then for bookmarks, I don't think we even need an input. So I'm going to delete that Zod stuff. I need to double check if I even did this correctly. Um, so actually, before I do this, let me, let me just tell you that I probably just broke my UI, right? Because I changed the, the method name for how we um, bookmark a template. So if I go back to my UI, there should be a template card here and I should get some red now because this is the wrong name for it. I need to instead put a namespace here called bookmark.bookTemplate. Bookmark.bookmarkTemplate, I believe. Is that created correctly? Anyway, this naming I could probably change to make it sound better. Hey Tina, are the girls still sleeping? You know, I got up, Tina, I got up to like 40-something viewers on the stream at one point. Like, it was crazy. All right, so we need to go back, double-check our code. We got this bookmark namespace, calling a bookmark router. Everything should still work now. Um, all I do is move some code around. But we're trying to add a new endpoint here. And we are going to basically add a new method called get bookmarks that needs to get the session ID of the user. Oh, I'm sorry, it needs to get the user ID um, like this. We don't care about input here. You must be logged in to, to fetch bookmarks. All right, so let's try this. Um, okay, so sorry, I'm having some trouble focusing right now. What am I trying to do? There's so much code cleanup I need to do, but let's just keep on keeping the ball moving so I can actually show you guys adding some functionality. So I need to basically query Prisma. Um, I don't remember how to do it. <laughs> Is it find? Find mini, I believe. And I can pass it a where statement. And I want to get back, I want to get back all my bookmarks that belong to this user. So I think I can just do this. And I'm going to go ahead and say bookmarks, bookmarks like this. And let me delete some of this extra spacing because it's bothering me. Um, I'm going to go back to the chat in just a second, um, but I feel like I'm close to finishing this. So let's verify we can actually call this. Find all bookmarks with these. Does this seem good, y'all? Chat, can you check this? Does this seem good? You guys are my pair programmers, right? We're doing like a giant uh, 
what's the word group programming session right now so if you see any bugs let me know but i think it might work let's go back to the template card <clears throat> all right so we are when this hmm, when the template card loads I'm going to try something. I don't know if this is the best approach. I think when the templates load, we should fetch all the bookmarks. But the fact that we're using uh, TRPC and that uses React Query under the hood, we might just be able to like hack this and put the requests for all the bookmarks here. Um, what is it called? I already forgot what I call this thing. <sighs> Let me use TypeScript. I have autocomplete. I could just do dot and it should tell me what methods I have. Oh, it's not a mutation. So we're not doing a mutation in this instance. We're actually doing a use query. And I think this needs to have data. And I could say bookmarks. And then I could say bookmark here, do a dot. It should autocomplete, hopefully. Maybe not. I'm not sure why that's not working. Let's see. Can't tell if this is a real error or if I just need to wait five seconds while everything reloads. Argument of type string is not assignable. Get bookmark is premium. Oh, I think I need to pass it a key. So yeah, the way you use React queries, I believe you have to pass it an array of like strings or values or whatever, and it kind of combines them all together and that acts as your cache key. So the fact is we have three different templates and they're all fetching bookmarks from the back end. I might have to refactor this. I don't know if this is gonna like be super uh, inefficient. But the idea is that when I, like when these template cards load, it should only fetch this once because like, I think React Query under the hood like does like all this caching and this smart fetching where like if you try to fetch the same thing 15 times, it's just going to wait for like one to finish. Um, I don't know. Let's try this out. It bookmarks. Wow, it does a batch fetch too. Like, look at this. It knows that it needs to fetch is premium and bookmarks at the same time. So it does one request to the back end, and the back end is smart enough to basically combine all that data together. I did not know TRPC does that, but that is that's actually really cool. I'm not gonna lie. Anyway, um, so we have we should have some bookmark data back. Let me go to my console, and what I'm gonna do is you know, I'm not going to go to my console. What am I going to do? I'm trying to... I'm going to take a step back. Let me breathe. So we're trying to change the color of this bookmark based on if you bookmarked it or not. So this is a super simp simple feature, but as you can tell, even a simple feature blows up in complexity when you have to keep track of state on your database. So let's find the bookmark, which I believe is this one. And we need to dynamically change the uh text so i'm gonna go ahead and say class names i'm gonna pass it all that text and save this let's see if i can import class names i don't think this is an import so i have to like go and actually manually do this Yeah, my VS Code theme is Shades of Purple. Sorry, I'll go back to the chat and actually share like what people are saying in a second. Oh, I do have class names already imported. I'm just trying to stay focused. Um, so based on if the bookmark for this template is set, what I'm going to do is I want to change the text like this from yellow to gray, depending on if it's bookmarked or not. So by default, I'm going to go ahead and make it gray. And then if 
the current template we're looking at has actually been bookmarked. So I can say book marks dot wait, what am I doing? I need to say text yellow 300. Um, and then I'm going to say hover text yellow. All right, so we need to find to see, is there already a bookmark for this, this thing? So template ID, find if there's a template ID that matches template dot template ID. Okay, again, we could do some cleanup. This is not performant to do this twice, but what's the saying? Free optimization is the root of all evil. There's also another saying, make it work. Make it right. Make it fast. I don't know if I said that right. But those are some of the things I try to code for. Although, why is this... Why is this not... Uh, is this not an array? Object is possibly undefined. Okay, yeah. So we don't need to do this logic if bookmarks is not defined. So I'm going to go ahead and put a question mark here because it potentially could not be defined. And uh, I forgot to even put a Boolean condition here. So let's put the Boolean expression and find the bookmark that equals to the template bookmark. Um, honestly, it might make more sense to, yeah, I'm going to clean this up. This is bad code. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this out. I'm going to put this to the top here. And I'm going to make a constant called is bookmarked. Go ahead and copy all that in. So now this is a much cleaner approach. We're not doing the same for loop two places. And the code reads more like a book. So let's see if this works. All right, so it I don't think it worked. Um, this should have been turned to yellow. So what I'm going to try to do is, I have a feeling maybe it's because I'm applying this gray text. Is bookmarked. Fine, bookmarks. Um... So I might have to use an effect or something. I mean, I guess this would re-render, but first this could be undefined. Let me just do this. I don't think I just add a exclamation mark because there this could be undefined. When this component first is mounted, like bookmarks will be undefined, right? Until the request comes back from the back end and finishes, this won't be defined. So I need to actually, you know, set this to false until it has been bookmarked. But the idea is I want to make sure that we get the bookmarks back here. And we get back some data here. Template ID. So what am I doing wrong here? So find a bookmark by template ID that equals the current template ID that we're at. And if this is true, let me just go ahead and print out is bookmarked. At some point we should see it print out is true into the console. Is bookmarked. Uh, Oh, is there an exists in JavaScript? I forget, like find, there's a contains, but that's not gonna work for, there's different ways you can do this. I'm gonna do a find and do a double bang. Like, is this the best approach? I don't know. Someone in chat can probably let me know, but I feel like there's a better method for this to know if something exists in an array or not. You could use find index, but then you'd have to check to make sure it's equal to zero or not zero. Um, let's see. 
All right, so is bookmarked is printing out true? So I think that logic works fine. The issue is that uh, dot includes. Yeah, but the issue no with dot includes is like you actually have to pass it the identical object, I think, right? So dot include works great for like an array of strings or array of numbers because those are primitives. But when you pass it, Yeah, yeah, maybe mini is what I want to use. I forgot about that. Um, I think it's called, are you sure it's called mini? I thought it was called sum. JavaScript array sum. I'm pretty sure it's called sum. So if one or one or more of the Boolean expressions are true, then the entire thing will be true. Uh, I think there's another one for like every. Anyway, yeah, this is a better approach. I like this. Thank you for kind of suggest suggesting many because it made me think of some. So if any of those bookmarks contains a truthy Boolean expression, this will be true, which will set that to true. And then <clears throat> now we just need to figure out why it's not actually setting this text correctly. I think maybe there's like a precedence issue where maybe I need to do this object first because it's like not overriding it down here with Tailwind. Or maybe you can't do this with Tailwind. I don't know. Let's save it and see what happens. By the way, y'all, I did recently make a Patreon. Um, if anyone is interested in signing up for that, um, I got my first person on Patreon a couple days ago, so I'm super stoked about that. But if I've ever made content that you think has been useful or has helped you out and you feel like giving back in some way, you can check out my Patreon page. Or just send me some donations on this live stream, let's be honest. I'm here begging for some coffee money. All right, let's go back to why this is not working. All right, let me go back to the chat. Someone's probably got the answer. I'm going to try to catch up because I haven't checked this in a while. So I know. Oh, wow. I got up to 50, Tina. Shout out to my wife. This is my wife. She's always the first one that comments on my videos. So if someone were to beat her on a comment, I will be really impressed. Uh, see, Noah says, not using GitHub Copilot. I've been loving it for months. Yeah, I was using it for a while, and then they started charging money for it, and I stopped using it because I'm cheap. It's as simple as that. I would definitely, if it was free, I would definitely use it again. I think it's like 9 bucks to 10 bucks a month or something, so I should probably just buy it. But I don't know. I'm cheap. So the VS Code theme, Shades of Purple. I don't know if you're still on the stream, but that's the VS Code theme I'm using. Marco Polo says, isn't VS Code prohibited by hard code codres? Um, I don't know. I don't know what hard code coders use. They probably use Vim. I don't even know what a hard code coder is, let's be honest. Noah says, what are you talking about? Yep, same thing. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Abza, Abdul Ram, Rahman. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Are you going to make CI CD for this code? Um, well, right now I'm deploying this on Vercel, so it's like every time I commit to GitHub, it automatically deploys. Um, and then I can hook in GitHub Actions if I wanted to do like a PR workflow and have it just test, lint, do whatever. But yeah, CI CD is kind of set up with Vercel already, so like I guess the answer is yes, I am. Um, Logan says, hey, everyone, just getting some coffee before I start working on my side project. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thanks for joining the stream. Uh, let's go back. Web Dev Junkie says includes. Yeah, this won't work for non-primitives, I don't think. Maybe it does. I have to look into it. Does, does includes take a callback function? I could probably go Google it. Uh, but we figured this out. I'm just using dot sum. Noah says, oh, I see what the context was. Sorry, only partially paying attention. No worries. Uh, you need template strings with conditions if it's clicked. Oh shoot, VS Code rules. Thank you so much, Martin. 
got my first donation on this live stream today so i definitely appreciate that two pounds is that the pound symbol thank you so much definitely definitely appreciate that um click to do the effect else the standard color yeah i need to send my patreon link how do i even do this i think it's just patreon that web dev junkie Out here trying to get that cash get that cash flow going you know it's a hard knock life for a youtuber getting five five bucks a month from patreon users um let's see <clears throat> sherry says i was getting ready for a lecture and i accidentally found you and you said something about coffee what kind of coffee is it black no sugar that would be me and good morning to your wife welcome to the stream hopefully i'm not distracting too much from your <laughs> your lecture uh marco polo says i got the the free github student bundle and i have it for free man that's awesome how do you actually prove you're a student do you just need like a student email i'm sure i could try to find one noah says i thought about it but we the number of hours i've been coding copilot is more than worth than netflix yeah i definitely i think i might reconsider it when i don't have a really slow computer um because right now like you see it takes like five, 10 seconds for TypeScript to finish running and figuring out like what's wrong with my code. So I think adding another plugin called Copilot to like <laughs> give me more auto suggestions is just gonna break my VS code. <laughs> yes, my wife, she knows what's up. She like, she knows my Starbucks coffee. Uh, for conditional classes i make variables and use those for better readability i might check that out oh okay <laughs> ab ab abudi is that how i pronounce that abudi abudai i feel like i'm dumb when it comes to pronouncing other people's names i'm so sorry but oh welcome welcome And thanks for asking all your questions in the Discord. Like, I know you think you're annoying me with all your questions, but it helps me like really think about, uh, you know, how to. I don't know. And when people ask me questions in Discord, it just makes me better at understanding like where people are coming from and how to like teach better and how to learn from what you all are learning. Uh. Or says, I honestly only took a pic of my grade sheets and they granted me with the student pack. That would be hard since I'm the one giving a lecture. Oh, you're the one giving the lecture. Did I read that wrong? Oh, you're getting ready for a lecture. Well, good luck on your lecture. What's your lecture about? What are you teaching? Um. All right, what was I doing? I'm still trying to figure out this stupid bug where, like, this should be gray. Like, I bet you... Um, let me do this. Someone gave a good suggestion. What I'm going to do is, I wish I could scope stuff. Can you scope stuff in, uh, whatever. So I'm going to make a constant. Someone made the suggestion about uh, making your class names be variables. I think that's a good idea. So I'm going to say is book marked class names something like that so i'm gonna say is bookmarked do a ternary and then we can say text yellow 300 text yellow 400 i think this needs to be a hover Um, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and do this instead of doing this object, which doesn't seem to be working for some reason, I'm going to go ahead and just make the text hover and text state come from a variable. And I think I can just combine them like this. And it works. I have it backwards though so let me swap that let's go back up to here i'm gonna go ahead and just swap this real quick 
There we go. So if you're bookmarked, you're going to make a yellow and uh, oops, let me get rid of that semicolon. All right, so we finally did it. I have the ability to bookmark things and uh, I probably need to invalidate the cache. Like there's always more stuff you got to add in. So if I click on this one and bookmark it, um, it just sent a request to the back end, but it didn't change in the front end, right? So the cool thing about React Query is I think you can kind of invalidate the cache when you do stuff. Um, I don't remember how to do that. I think it's like, there might be an invalidate function. Uh, if anyone knows, let me know, but I'm going to go to the React Query Invalidate. Oh, I think I'm invalidating the wrong thing. I think I need to invalidate. Validate. Is this how you do it? Invalidate is assigned but never used. So again, like you could do client side prediction or what's it called? But let's just see if this works. Again, like I'm not gonna try to make this the most performant code. I think I can add a callback here called like on success. And I can call invalidate here. If anyone in the stream is really familiar with React Query, uh, let me know if this is the proper way to kind of do this stuff. It obviously isn't because I'm getting a red invalidate is not a function here. So let's go back to the docs, which I was about to go to. Um, query client and validate queries. There's gotta be an easier way to do that. Maybe you have to do this, query client invalidate queries. I thought there was a way to just like invalidate it directly. But maybe there's not query invalidation. You have yext. Line 33, I wrote yext. Okay, search for Yext. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Good catch, y'all. Good catch. But I still don't think that helps the issue um, because I think the, the data is going to be stale, right? So I need to like either do some client-side um, prediction or I need to invalidate the query so I'll refetch the bookmarks from the back end. There's so many different ways you can do this. Some of them are more performed than the others. I like to just do the easiest approach first. But ugh, let's just do this. I feel like there's a better way to do this. Use query. All right, so these are the things we get back from uh, refetch. That's what I want. <laughs> I want refetch, not invalidate. Refetch, I think we'll just basically refetch this stuff, I think. Again, like there, I know there's better ways to do this. This is not the most performant way, but uh, the way I work is I just try to get the thing working and then make it right and then make it fast. So let's, cool. So I clicked it and you notice that it actually changed directly. Now I think that was because I added the refetch logic and not because I changed the uh, misspelling for text. But now we can't unbookmark it, right? So when I click on the bookmark again, there's no endpoint to unbookmark it. So let's go back full circle. Let's do this all over again. Um. So let's go back to our bookmarks router and this should be a lot faster to do since we have like 
all this logic already set. We could potentially hack at this endpoint to make it toggle, like dynamically change from being bookmarked to not. What is the best approach? Uh, it probably makes more sense to like add another endpoint called like unbookmark, to be honest with you all. So I'm going to go ahead and say unbookmark template. And we're going to do the exact same logic. I know I need to come through here and clean up this code. Like some of the stuff could be pulled out into middleware, or just like a helper function. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take in a bookmark ID. No, I guess I could just use a template ID, couldn't I? Um, I need to delete the record. So I'm going to say delete where the user ID and the template ID match. Okay, so I should just delete the entire record from the database and uh, template ID string is. All right, so we got a TypeScript error. What's what's going on here? Type user ID string template ID string is not assignable to the type bookmark where unique input object literal may only specify known properties and user ID does not exist. <laughs> um, why would this not work? Maybe I need to do like a delete mini. Okay, I'm going to change this a little bit. I'm going to say book mark ID is what takes into here. And we're going to delete where ID is equal to bookmark ID. Okay, so it's a little bit different than what I was planning to do. I think I might have had to do a delete mini if I wanted to um, actually use the other query that we're about to use. Anyway, uh, I don't need user ID anymore, I guess because we have a unique identifier for that bookmark instance. So let's, um, let's try this. Let's see how this works. So I'm going to go ahead and make a new mutation here called delete, or I'm going to, I'm going to call it unbookmark template. Keep it consistent. Go ahead and call unbookmark template. And we can call that depending on if we're bookmarked or not. So we might have to, um, make a helper function here called toggle bookmark. Toggle bookmark. And I'm going to go ahead and have it take in the bookmark ID, maybe. Uh, we'll figure it out. All right, so if you click on uh, where's my bookmarks? Here they are. So if you click on it, instead, I'm going to call toggle bookmark. And I'm going to take this code out and I'm going to put it inside of this function here. Okay. Now the difference is that this thing might need to take in a bookmark ID. Let me just go ahead and do like this, lean that up a little bit. Does it all make sense what I'm trying to do? Like I'm trying to, I, I might just need to dynamically say like, if is bookmarked, then we need to do that new function that we called. Otherwise, we're gonna have to do this. So let's just go ahead and, this is called hacking at its finest. Hacking at this code. Um. This thing needs to take in a bookmark ID. Luckily, TypeScript told us that was wrong, but I remembered. And we need to know which bookmark ID we're interested in. So what we could do is kind of do like a reverse search. We have all the bookmarks here. And we could find the one that matches the template. So let's do template ID. You know, we have this whole Boolean expression. Let's just reuse it. And we are going to basically find the bookmark ID, which this thing should just have an ID here, I believe. 
and this is possibly undefined. So if if this thing is not defined, uh, I'm going to return. You don't want to be able to call this method if bookmarks is not defined. Uh, it's saying this thing is possibly undefined as well. I wonder why that's doing that. Possibly undefined. Okay, okay, my TypeScript is just going crazy here. Has an implied any. Okay, well this thing needs to be a string, probably. Let me just make TypeScript happy real quick. Oh wait, I can't do that. Actually, I kind of wonder why this is complaining. Isn't bookmarks already a... No, it's not. Bookmark. Bookmarks. Mark has implied any. All right, so I think I might have to, like, figure out a way to type this thing. I think I can do this. Um, right now I'm just making TypeScript happy, like I need to make sure I have my Prisma bookmark type set into use query so that it knows how to work with it, but, oh, there's two of them. That's not good. As bookmark icon. Um, <clears throat> oh, this needs to be an array of bookmarks. Let's do that. Is that how you do it? I might just uh, stop worrying about trying to type this stuff. Um, I thought ERPC should already know what I'm returning from this. So I'm not sure if I'm doing something wrong. It bookmarks like this should be an array of bookmarks, which it is, which means that use query was supposed to be smart enough to know that like the way TRPC works or is kind of argued to work is that data should already be scoped as a bookmark array, which it is. But object is okay. My TypeScript is going crazy. I think it's giving me errors that aren't like actually uh, real, but I'm going to go ahead and just pull this up here and I'm going to go ahead and move all this like this. Yeah, I read comments. Sorry, I have my comments over on my phone on my right, but I find that I get really distracted when I keep on having to take breaks from what I'm actually trying to do, which is build something, and then going back to the comments and stuff. So I will go back when I feel like I'm at a good stopping point and address the comments. Um, so just give me a second. Uh, JavaScript is, I'm using TypeScript. Right now I'm just fighting like <laughs> compile errors, but Again, I'm trying to learn TypeScript, so I'm not like the best at it. But what I'm trying to do is uh, just make this thing happy. If bookmark All right, I think I'm almost there. I think this should be typed as a bookmark. All right, let's uh, let's give this a shot. 
this seemed good. Anyone who's really good at TypeScript, like, is this just hacky as heck? Um. Anyway, let's see what happens. So we got some bookmarks here. I'm going to click on this one. And it should have made an endpoint request to my next app. Let me click it again. Click it again. Click it again. Click it again. 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 should match. Which it should because React Query is kind of using the server state and displaying that in the UI. So what I saw in the UI should match exactly what's in the server. All right, there you have it. So now we can bookmark stuff and all those bookmarks will be stored for the user and we can kind of use that data at a later point to kind of just have a list of all the people's bookmarks. All right, let me just read through some comments. I know some people are getting frustrated that I'm not answering comments. Uh, Rohan asked, oh wait, let's just go back up. Uh, Sherry says, I'm a theoretical scientist, and today's lecture is going to be on applied mathematics, robotics, and construction. Wow, that sounds uh, very interesting, man. <laughs> Good luck on that talk, but I'm assuming that you have it kind of honed in, so good luck anyway. Or says, you should be using a memo for is bookmarked instead of rechecking every render. Um... Yeah, so for something like this, like if you think about how many bookmarks a user can have, like maybe they might have 100 or 200, doing a for loop over 100 items in JavaScript takes less than like a millisecond. So using a use memo is actually probably going to add some overhead and make it take longer than just doing the logic. I mean, yeah, there's probably some small performance benefits, but I don't think it's important to use memo here, to be honest. Um, I like to add use memo when stuff actually slows down and not just add to things that you think are going to be slow. Like add in some console time statements, figure out how much longer the for loop is actually taking. Use the React profiler, try to figure out where stuff is slow. But if you don't notice stuff is slow, then you don't need memo. Uh, Marco Polo said, do you listen to music while coding or do you find it distracting? I try to listen to some music sometimes. Um, Usually I listen to like liquid drum and bass or house music, just something that's like chill. Chill hop is fun to listen to as well. Thank you all for fixing my bug here. This actually helped me find that error. Um, Jerry says, it's quite enjoyable to watch the people in chat window give you suggestions and change patterns for your thought. It is quite interesting. Thank you. Try out a sequence. Yeah, I I like doing live streams because like I learn new things and people give me new suggestions on stuff. It's really useful. Rohan says, can we just store the bookmarks in Zustan and push that to the DB? Um, technically, yeah, we could. There's 101 ways that you can code stuff. Um, but I'm not sure if having Zustan have side effects in it is a good good approach. Like I don't think Zustan should know about invoking your API. Maybe it could. I mean, that's kind of like a, a Redux thing where your Redux actions are the ones invoking API requests. But if I can just let React Query do its thing, then I'm just going to try to keep React Query doing its thing. So Islam asked, could you please talk about the tech stack that you're using for this project? Yeah, I'm using the T3 stack. There is a URL here. Um, and here are the, the tech here are the buzzwords I'm using. Next.js, which is kind of like a server-side rendering library. You've probably heard of it. ERPC is like a communication layer between your front end and your back end, um, which is allowing me to basically get this like nice auto-completion where um, basically if you saw I hovered over bookmarks here, it's already typed to a bookmark of a, an array of bookmarks. Excuse me, and the, that's all kind of defined with TRPC because the back end I said it's going to return a certain data structure, and the front end already gets all those types in TypeScript. Tail and CSS, that's what you're seeing here with all the class names. Um, just a bunch of helper class names you can use to kind of style your application, color it, 
uh, do whatever you need to do. It's kind of interesting, and it makes it actually really fun and more proficient to kind of style your application when you get good at all this stuff. TypeScript, again, that's for the type safety. Prisma is the ORM we're using to connect to my MySQL database. At the beginning of the stream, I kind of showed you how I created a new table inside of my database schema. And that's how we're storing the bookmarks. And then next auth is being used for allowing my users to log in with Google. I have some authentication here where you can log in with Google. Um, yeah, so that's my stack that I'm currently using. Uh, Abudai says, use ternary operator to make things cleaner. Yeah, I like using the ternary sometimes. I don't like using ternaries here, to be honest. Um, let me show you where I don't like using ternaries. Panel. All right, so here I have um, is expanded and not as expanded. I don't like using ternaries here, to be honest. I think it makes your React code a lot harder to understand. But that's just my personal preference. So I like using ternaries if it's an actual like logic up here, like a smaller thing, but not in your actual templates. Uh, or says to find method is possibly undefined, not the bookmarks because finding like here to find it if you're sure it exists, which is the case here because the bookmark is just there. Just add the exclamation mark at the end of the find method. Uh, yeah, I could definitely do that. I totally forgot about some of that stuff. Where is that template? Hard. Yeah, so he's saying I could basically just do this.id. Um, but my linter doesn't like me using this exclamation mark for some reason. I'm assuming there's a good reason why they don't recommend you use the exclamation mark. So I'm trying to just trust in the people who are smarter than me who made the linter. Um, you can see code god previsio. Says, hello what are you making uh, yeah so i'm working on an application where people can come in and kind of make a bunch of predefined youtube thumbnails um mainly it's for me so i can actually start making real thumbnails for my channel i usually just allow youtube to just pick the best thumbnail already but basically it's a way to come in here and i can like change some text and change some colors and stuff. And I can click an export button and then I actually get a PNG that I can upload to YouTube and start like applying that to all my thumbnails. So if you start seeing thumbnails that look really template-y, it's because I'm actually using my own product soon. That is what I'm working on. I do read comments. Like I said, I just try to not distract myself too much. I actually want to build something on this stream. And the more I go back to comments, the more I get distracted. But I do come back and just try to like address them like I'm doing right now. JavaScript looks complicated. Yeah, it can get kind of complicated, I'll be honest. Uh, let's see. Just do a check with the in and operator. Yeah, I think I got that whole logic figured out. I don't know if this is the best approach, but it works. Um, John McWay. Oh, hi there, sir. Welcome to the stream. Uh, or retracted his message. Rohan says, sometimes I just copy my code in an online JS formatter to spot the errors. Yeah. I mean, like, that's a good good point. I mean, like, your code editor should hopefully help you find the, editor, the errors, but sometimes it doesn't. I feel claustrophobic looking at your ID having only 50 lines of code at a time. Yeah. I'm using 720p on my stream right now because my computer can't handle 1080. I could probably zoom out one, but you have to remember a lot of people watch these things on their phone. So I want to make sure I'm at the right zoom level that if someone's watching on their phone, they're not like squinting their eyes. But I don't know if this, is this font size good for you all? Let me know. Rohan says, thus stand a React query to push that to the DB. Um, Let's see. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I, I have to look into that. I think the way I'm doing it should be fine unless you can actually pinpoint like what I'm doing is not good. But I mean, I think this works. Kind of like leveraging a lot of the stuff that React Query provides at the box, like caching and stuff. So um, Islam, I think this type of video are more useful than prepared tutorials because debugging or this kind of stuff are not shown in ordinary tutorials. Thanks. So keep it up, mate. Yeah, I think watching someone code live is actually the best way to learn how to code. 
Um, I think sometimes people get too dependent on tutorials and like the tutorial is basically holding your hand the whole time. You're not actually seeing them actually, like you're not watching someone else's thought process. And that's like the most important thing about coding is how do you problem solve? How are these people able to code what they're coding? Like where is a thought process happening that they know to add an if statement or, you know, they know how to do some of these things. So yeah, watching live coding, it just takes more time up front because you have to sit there and, you know, watch these streamers read through their comments and watch them get distracted. But it's the way I learned. Um, I think one of the, the things that was like most beneficial to my career is that we did a lot of pair programming at my job. So I was able to actually work with people who are a lot more experienced with me every day. So like eight hours a day, imagine being on a Zoom call where you and someone else are just sharing your screens and you actually get to learn and absorb as much knowledge as you can from that other person. So pair programming and watching people live, I think is one of the best ways to learn how to code. Um, second to actually coding it yourself and trying to struggle. Uh, no, my MacBook didn't arrive yet. It's supposed to come Monday. So I'll keep my fingers crossed. Uh, Noah says it's a good font size. Uh, Alexandro says, do you get imposter syndrome? Yeah, I actually have a video I'm probably going to publish tomorrow or something about when you feel like you're not um, knowledgeable enough on a topic, even though like you probably have a lot of knowledge. So I'm going to drop that video tomorrow, which is me kind of ranting about that. But yeah, sometimes I do get imposter syndrome, but not as much. Um, I think when the more you watch social media and the more you like watch other YouTubers, you start comparing yourself to them and you're like, dude, these people are so smart. Like I, <laughs> I don't know if you've um, watched the YouTuber Theo at T3GG, but you watch his stuff and you're like, dude, this guy is like super smart. And like you compare yourself to him, but then you need to take a step back and realize that like, you know a different subset of things that other people might not know and you have your own like skills and expertises so like I, th I think getting over imposter syndrome is a like you actually need to just learn stuff like the more you know the more confident you're going to be about talking about these things and feeling like you can actually contribute to like conversations and stuff um but i think a lot of it's a confidence thing and another part of it is just like knowledge like if if you don't know stuff if you've only been coding for a year you don't have imposter syndrome you're just a beginner right so you don't really know what you're doing so it makes sense to feel like an imposter because technically you kind of are an imposter because you don't know what you're doing but yeah i mean like if you're in internship that makes sense to feel like you're an imposter because you you're inexperienced right and it's not that you're an imposter. You just need to realize that you're an intern. You're not a junior developer. You're not a mid developer. You're not a senior developer. You are a intern. And I guess one way to really put your personal experience into perspective is to find other interns as well. And I have a lot of interns on my discord and like they struggle. They talk about how they struggle and like how much, you know, they feel like anxiety going into work because they feel like everyone's just like smarter than them and stuff and they have no idea what they're doing. And I think even for me, like when I first started coding, like the first couple of years, I don't feel like I actually knew what I was doing. It, and until you reach a certain point where you can actually start solving the problems yourself and not asking for help, you're always going to kind of feel like an imposter. Yeah, I guess... Or says Theo is good, but there are many other YouTubers who are much better than him. Um, I like his content mainly because it's like really, it's it's a higher level content. It's not like these introduction here. You here's how you do like a learn to do stack. It's like actually stuff that it's like a more advanced level. So I enjoy watching that stuff. But yeah, there's other YouTubers who the word when you say better. Um, it's all, you know, perspective, I guess. Like, it depends on what you're trying to go for. If I, if I want someone to explain to me, like, why I would use Next over something like Dino or Fresh, I might go check out his channel because he has a lot of, like, advanced topics that kind of touch on that. But, yeah. Uh, I might, if, if there's no more outstanding questions, like, feel free to ask your questions now. I've been streaming for a while. I actually implemented the feature where I can bookmark and unbookmark some of these templates. 
So I'm going to wrap up the stream and probably go make some breakfast for me and my wife if my wife hasn't already made her fish. But yeah, anyway, uh, hope you guys enjoyed watching this. Be sure to, again, join my Discord if you want to be able to talk with my community or ask me questions. Uh, if you feel generous, next time I do streams, be sure to you know, throw some donations my way if you want. I think you can do like super chats in the stream if you want to help me out. I also have a Patreon that I just started to try to get some, you know, some chunk, chunk change donations if anyone wants to help donate. Uh, yeah, this, this I definitely agree with. Um, I think he puts off a, I don't want to talk poorly about anyone. He seems like a good guy, but Sometimes he puts off this vibe that he is extremely like a genius or something um, versus me, my channel. I'm trying to actually show you guys that I don't know what the hell I'm doing <laughs> half the time. And it's always a learning experience for me. And I'm trying to keep myself humble in that approach. So it's just different personality styles, but he's very entertaining to watch. I will say that. Um, Yeah, it's funny that that last video I said I was wrong about TypeScript, like that video blew up. It's crazy. So I'm trying to figure out a way to like hack the system to keep on making random talks like that. But sometimes you just make a video that you didn't think was going to be popular and it just blows up, which I'm grateful for. But I need to think about more things I was wrong on. Uh, Rohan says a Japanese dude. You talk about the guy who like sits there and you can see his hands typing. Uh, and then you can see he's like using Vim or something. I think I've seen like one of his videos. I'll tell you, I had this idea of like, I should put a virtual headset on or like a GoPro and like, it's me teaching you how to code, but through a lens of a GoPro. I don't know if that'd be cool or just be stupid, but I think that'd be an interesting YouTube channel. So if you are watching my channel and you want to make a YouTube channel, I'm telling you, go out, buy a GoPro. And put it on your head, and you could do like this VR coding live thing. He uploaded another video after. Yes, Rohan, thank you so much. Definitely appreciate the super chat. On two super chats this stream, so I'm super stoked about that. Thank you all. Um. Yeah, I think saying I'm a... People love when you, on YouTube, that you're authentic and you can kind of admit that you're wrong about stuff because I think one thing that a lot of YouTubers do is they try to put off this this perfect perception that they know everything. And let's be honest, no one knows everything. Most of us are just kind of like trying to figure it out along the way. You know, what are you saying sounds weird? <laughs> some of this stuff out all right well thank you all for joining my live stream i'm gonna drop uh a great day and happy coding y'all